Oh, we're dear Lord. Thank you for this opportunity to gather before your word. And be this, Lord, as we study the fabric of Christianity and how it applies to our lives as Christian and children of the living God. Help us to understand, Lord, this process, Lord, and how it makes us better at being the witnesses of you that we need to be. As they say in the name of Jesus. Amen. Greetings, and welcome to Amos Seed and Feed. We have been studying about the fabric of Christianity. We've talked about first personal and more recently the internal, which was the instruction in righteousness, reproof, and correction, and not necessarily in that order. And all these things are very important to us, but how, does, how do we tie all this together between the personal and internal? It is actually through doctrine, which is the word we're going to discuss today. And what does the Bible teach about that? Before we begin in that part, let's go ahead and look at our memory verses. The first one being for the internal, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And then for doctrine specifically, we have a memory verse, Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So one of the first things we need to know and understand is, what is doctrine? What is it really? And so we're going to do do that by looking at Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, but also Noah Webster's 1828 Dictionary. As I mentioned early on in this series, Noah Webster's 1828 Dictionary is very important to us as Christians because Noah Webster believed that education without the Bible was absolutely useless. And so the dictionary is definitely heavily steeped in helping us understand what the words are in the Bible. Not necessarily all of them, but he covers a lot of those verses that are that well, we, we would consider common, but he brought them out in such a way that we would understand what each word means so we fully understand what God's word has to tell us. But also getting that from Strong's Exhaust Concordance, G1319 is the number that's referenced in the Greek text. And it means teaching, instruction, and learning. And then doctrine, found in Noah Webster's 1820 Dictionary, tells us it is the act of teaching, learning, knowledge, instruction, and confirmation in the truths of the gospel. But also, doctrines of, of the gospel are the principles of truths taught by Christ and his apostles. So what we see is doctrine is actually a capsule. It includes the personal, reading, studying, meditating. But it also includes what we learned in the internal, reproof, correction, and instruction of righteousness. It is all contained because it's learning, but it's also teaching. In fact, if you go back to the title slide, you will see I've got two pages of the instruction book for the compass that we've been using within this series as a symbol of what we're studying, the direction we need to be going, and the fact that we need to make sure we're going in the right direction. But those instructions are not only something that teaches us, but we are learning from that as well. It's all one package. If we look at what we've covered so far within the fabric of Christianity, we see how that all ties together. Personal, reading, study, meditation, reproof, correction, instruction, all encapsulated under doctrine. So if we go to Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, which is our memory verse. I beseech you, therefore, brother, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This passage of Scripture does not even use the term doctrine even once. But when we're talking about learning, te teaching and learning, God's Word teaches us, and we learn from that, and we should be taking it as instruction in righteousness, 
using it as correction in our lives, or being reproved if we're way off course. And I say that from the standpoint that we are not to be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewal of our mind. But how is that going to happen unless we read, study, and meditate, and then take it seriously what we've done during that process and allow it to change our lives by instruction and in righteousness, by reproof, by correction. And so that's why we need to understand these, this process and not conform into this world. It's all part of doctrine, not just these little bits and pieces that we're learning in this lesson, but it's the entirety of God's Word to help us know and understand who God is and who we should be in order to have that proper relationship with God the Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. How important is it, or is it, is it just something superficial, this doctrine? Let's go to John chapter 7, verses 16 and 17. Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Jesus is talking to the religious leaders of his day. And he says that the doctrine I'm teaching isn't mine, it's God the Father's. He's the one that sent me, and his doctrine is what I'm teaching. And then he goes on to say in 17, If any man will do his will, he shall know the doctrine. And what have we actually learned so far? Reading, studying, and meditating are those things we are supposed to do as a Christian. Those are the things that are going to help us to know the doctrine. That is what's going to help us know his will. In so doing, we are now going to be able to determine whether someone is truly speaking of God or speaking of himself. And that's what Jesus is talking about. You're the religious leaders of the church. If you're doing what you're supposed to be doing as religious leaders, you're going to be reading, studying, and meditating, and you're going to know whether or not telling the truth or not. And that's what Jesus is saying. But there again, the main point being is that the doctrine comes from God. The reality is conforming to the world or continuing in sin, or both. So the question is, are we conforming to the world and continuing in our sin? Now, if we go to the process flow we developed throughout this series, the first three segments are the righteousness of Christ. That is the only way and only through Christ that we can gain acceptance and gain our salvation is only through Him. Understanding that He is the only source. It is by confessing our sins and believing on Him. Believing that God sent Him to pay for our sins. And that He truly did die, He was buried, and God raised Him from the dead. But the stop sign is, many people stop once that's done. They think that's all there is to it. And I will confess to you today that I was actually one of those individuals. Early on in my Christianity, I believe that once you got saved, there's nothing else to do. I really didn't need to really study. I didn't have to dedicate myself to anything. I am good to go. I got my ticket punch, and I'm getting on the train, and all is good. But the question is, is it? If we go to Romans chapter 6, verses 15 to 16, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves service to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. What we're looking at here in Romans is a measure. So because we accepted Jesus Christ as Savior, does that mean we can still continue our sins? It says here, God forbid. Know ye not that ye are servants of whom, whom you obey? So in other words, if we are obeying sin, who are, who are we the servants of? Are we still under the devil and under his demons, following what he desires for us in our lives instead of God the Father? Think on that for a minute. Really chew on that. If we continue in our sins, who are we really serving? We're not serving God. God cannot have anything to do with sin. So if we're still in our sins, we're not of God. 2 John chapter 1, verses 9-11 through 11. 
Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. Is If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. For he that biddeth him God speed is partaker of his evil deeds. Verse 9 is actually an echo of what we just said. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ doesn't have God. So the reality is, is that if we stop, we need to really look at ourselves because have we actually truly accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior? If we have, we should have the motivation and the desire to move beyond just accepting Christ, but now living for Him. And it talks about the fact, if anyone brings any doctrine contrary to this, don't bid him God's speed. Why? Because if they're saying that it's okay to just get saved and stop, you don't have to worry about nothing, God says don't even spend time with them. Do not even bid him Godspeed or God bless you or anything like that. Leave him alone. If you do, you are partakers of his evil deeds. Because he's not pointing you in the direction you need to go as a Christian. So, we need to be careful to maintain. Maintain what? A checklist. Let's look at a process flow again. Again, we have the salvation. Righteousness in Christ. That's where it all begins. It's the only place it can begin. Confessing that we are not capable of anything to gain God's acceptance or approval. It is only by believing in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And then there's the checklist. Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, visitation, giving, etc. Is there anything wrong on this list? Absolutely not. Nothing at all on this, on this list is wrong. But it should not be done as a checklist. Because this was another phase of my Christian life. Because I was, I was not a perfect Christian. Earlier on, once I got past the stop, I began to develop a checklist. And I felt, as long as I did these things, all was good. And I could go ahead after that and do whatever I want. Again, this is wrong thought process. To have a checklist and think that this is all we have to do and we are free to do whatever we want. Like going to school. I mean, you got to sit down and study, you got to listen to the teacher and all that kind of thing. But once you get out of school, boy, you just open those doors and you just race on out and do whatever you want to. That's not what Christianity is. And that's what we're talking about here. And if we go to Romans chapter 6 verses 17 and 18, but God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. So this passage of scripture actually ties together several of the things we've already discussed. First thing being, we were the servants of sin, but through the salvation of Jesus Christ in our lives, we no longer do that. But, we obey from the heart. In other words, it's not a checklist. All those things on that list, those are still things we would do as Christians, but we're not doing it as a checklist. We do it because we're obeying from the heart. So as you can see, it's a totally different reason and purpose for doing those things on a list than just being a checklist. How do we exercise this? We're going to go through several exercises here and actually demonstrate what we're talking about. Exercise A, we are called to good works. Titus 3, verse 8. It, this should actually look familiar because we've actually used that in the first section of personal through the Bible study talk, talking about works. So Titus 3, 8, this is a faithful saying that these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. If you remember, there were verses before this talking about salvation itself, the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the righteousness that we only get from Him, the only method of actually reaching the place that we can understand and accept Him as our Savior, and then our responsibility of confessing that without Him, we're nothing. There's nothing we can do. And then 
beyond that, actually taking the next step of believing truly that God has indeed raised Christ from the dead, conquering death and conquering sin and paying for that sin debt. And in so doing, we now have salvation. But in that believing, if you remember, to believe there's an action in there. There should be something that follows after that that demonstrates is evidence that we truly have accepted Christ. And that's what we find here. Being careful to maintain good works. We should, it's not just a one-time deal. We should continually be careful to maintain good works. Ephesians 2.10 For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Let's touch on the end here. Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. God has a process flow. <laughs> he, he does. God is organized. He is structured. There is no chaos. There is no confusion. It's the same steps for every single individual that accepts Jesus Christ as Savior. In so doing, it is preordained. The process is there for us to follow. We accept Christ as Savior. We now step into his process. In the first part of this verse, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So in other words, if we're created unto good works, now it's time to follow the process flow, to do those things that God has called us to do. Now if you remember, since this is a familiar verse, before this, by grace are you saved through faith, not of works. So there is a difference between works. There's a difference of before you, before you accept Christ as Savior, which are useless, and then after you accept Jesus Christ as Savior, they're very important to our Christian life. It's part of the process. Exercise B, works that are demonstration or evidence that we truly believe in our Lord Jesus Christ. James chapter 2, verses 18 and 19. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith. And I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. To me, this is one of the most fearful verses for the Christian in the Bible. Why would I say that? James opens up by saying that works with faith is the way it should be. But if you say you have faith, but you don't have works, what's the value of it? And then he does a comparison. Verse 19, If thou believest there's one God, you do well. But even the demons believe there's one God, and they tremble. So, going back to the process we had earlier, where we accept Christ as Savior, and then we stop. Who are we actually following are we nothing more than as the demons and the devils that we believe and that's it there's no works to follow the, de the, the devils believe and tremble we don't even tremble we go brazenly and do whatever we want we say we're Christians but yet we don't do Christian things we don't follow his word think on that for a minute Chew on it. Where do you stand? James is very clear on this. And if we go to James 23 and 24, And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified, not by faith only. So the example we see here is Abraham, a patriarch, of the Israelites. He is the beginning of that nation. And he had no children. But God made a promise and says, I'm going to make you a nation. I'm going to give you a son. Even though you say you're barren, there's no way for it to have children. I'm going to make sure it happens. And you're going to be a nation. And then he goes on to say, while you're at it, pack your bags, you're going to just travel. You're going to be someone that just follows every step of the way that I call you to go. And that's exactly what he did. 
He left the land of his nativity, as the Bible says. He left the land that he grew up in. In other words, he would have actually had some sort of inheritance because that's where he was from. But he forsook all those things to follow God. And his works proved that he truly did believe God. But it also justified him because he was in alignment with what God wanted for him in his life. If we go to James chapter 2, verses 25 and 26, it was right after what we just read. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So if you go to the Old Testament and you read about Rahab, you're going to see that when she talks to the messengers, she talks about the fact that the people of Jericho have been fearful of the Israelites for many years because they watched Israel in the wilderness. They saw that God was with them. They conquered great nations in the wilderness while they were waiting to go into the promised land. And Rahab believed that God truly was with them. And so we, she helped the messengers escape the city because she knew that the city was in God's hands. God was going to conquer that through the Israelites. She believed God. Her works demonstrated and was evidence that she truly did believe God. For the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Verse 26 in James chapter 2. But the thing we also want to look at is that what happened with these two people? Abraham is a patriarch of Israel. He is the beginning of that nation. God did truly make a nation. God prophesied to them. It was the world power at one point in time until they began to disobey God. They went into captivity. They came out. Jesus Christ, the Savior, came out of that nation. Rahab, not even remotely close to being Israelite. No. She was a harlot. She was doing all kinds of things that were against God's word at first. And then she believed God. Things changed. Even so much that she is part of the lineage of Jesus Christ. Read your Bible and find out. It's a very interesting story to read through the Old Testament and see how that works out. But there again, it is being obedient to what we should do. It was, it, I'm mean, sorry, not was, but for them it was, but for us it is. Works are very important for us. And this is something we've already talked about during the process of reading, studying, and meditating in God's Word. So that takes us to a process flow. Righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's the only place it begins. Confessing that it's only through Jesus that we are able to gain that, set, that acceptance of God, but also gain salvation. And then believing that God truly did send His Son to die, to be buried, paying for our sin debt, and conquering death and sin in, by, by raising from the dead. That is to be followed, as we learned in James, by works, our actions. Not just a checklist, but something that changes our lives to the point to where everything we do, every day, every hour, and every minute, is in accordance with what God would have us to do. And it is counted unto righteousness, just like Abraham. He, he gave up what he had in the world to be in the center of God's will. Rahab gave up her, her lineage and her, uh, her, her, her city, gave it up because she believed God. She let it go away, basically burning her ships. There's no place else to go except to go forward with God. And that's the way we should be. And what happens? It is counted as righteousness to us. We are justified in the eyes of God because we are obedient to Him. And in the reason for the circle, it's not that we have to get saved again. It's that we should be continually reminding ourselves, we accepted Jesus Christ as Savior. We confessed. We believe that God did send His Son. And for that reason, we are, should remind ourselves routinely that our actions should demonstrate 
and give evidence that we truly have done such a thing. Exercise C. What are we to do with this knowledge? Proverbs 23.12 tells us, Apply thine heart unto instruction, and thine ear to the words of knowledge. Moving on, Proverbs 15.9 and 10, The way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord, but he loveth him that followeth after righteousness. Correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way, and he that hateth reproof shall die. Moving on to Proverbs 17.10, A reproof entereth more into a wise man than a hundred stripes into a fool. So what are we saying here? We read, we studied, and we meditated. Now we're at a place, what we're talking about here in Proverbs, these three verses, we are to acknowledge the instruction of righteousness in our lives. We are to accept the correction that God gives us. And if we need to be reproved, we need to take it as a wise man and take it for our instruction that we may be more in tune and more closely in connection with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and God the Father. Because a wise man, what is a wise man? A wise man is someone that truly believes in God. He has the fear of the Lord in him. He desires to be more closely in tune with God. But a fool, he rejects God. You can beat him, you can abuse him, do whatever you want to. He's not going to acknowledge any of those things. And there again, there's a comparison here within these three verses. What are we in relation to Christ? Are we going to ignore and push away the reproof, the correction, instruction of righteousness? Or, or, or are we going to accept it and embrace it? and change our lives to be more like Christ. So let's go back through our memory verses before we close. Doctrine memory verse, Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And then the memory verse for this whole section of internal. All scripture is given by inspiration of God it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So that brings us to our close of this lesson today. We are looking at this from the standpoint of congealing everything that we've learned so far. Reading, studying, and meditating. Getting in information, those things that are taught to us. And then learning. Instruction of righteousness, reproof, and correction. Learn, and then applying those things to our lives as we just learned. Embracing those things like Abraham and Rahab and all those that come before us. Embrace it and do those things that are of God. Listen to what God's Word has to tell us and then take the internal, evaluate it. Where do we stand in the presence of a living God? This is going to directly relate to the next section, which is going to be the private. Why is it private? Because your relationship with Christ is only between you and Jesus Christ. No one else. You have to make that choice. But these first two sections, personal and internal, directly impact what that relationship with Christ is going to be and look like in your life. And as I'm breaking down the recording studio for what it is, I would like to make a recommendation to you. Some of you may have actually been through every single lesson along the way. And some of you may have actually come in to this lesson alone or maybe the one before. I'd like to encourage you to actually go back and re re review all the lessons that we've covered so far. This is number 11. And there's a lot of things we've covered along the way. If you're new, 
it's so you can get caught up with where we are today as we go into the next part, which is our personal relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the private part, the part of the fabric of Christianity that is only between you and Christ. But then if you have been through all the lessons, go back and rehearse what we've learned so that it will be fresh in your mind as we move into the next section. Because our relationship with Christ is first and foremost, or should be first and foremost in our lives. And it requires us to do things as part of God's process flow. As we're learning the lesson, the things that are ordained of God, that process flow that we should be following once we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. And I hope you do go back and do so. And I hope this lesson has been beneficial to you. And I'm looking forward to meeting you again in the next lesson as we continue the series, The Fabric of Christianity. Take care and have a great day.